Hi, I'm Roger Barker. Uh, I'm a consultant neurologist at Adambrooks Hospital in Cambridge and I'm the Professor of Clinical Neuroscience at the University of Cambridge. And I run a research program in Huntington's disease which involves uh, basic work as well as running the regional clinic where we see three to 400 patients with Huntington's disease from pre-manifest people who carry the gene but don't have any obvious features of the condition to people with uh, obvious manifest disease as well as advanced patients. In 2019, uh, Huntington's disease has reached a very interesting point in terms of its therapeutics and where we're actually going in terms of trying to cure people with this condition. Now, Huntington's disease, as you're probably aware, is an inherited disorder and you inherit this abnormal gene and this abnormal gene uh, will at some point express itself in your life and you will develop the condition. So before we come on to discuss treatments, I would say one of the great challenges in trying to um, decide how best to treat this condition is knowing when people actually have this disorder. So obviously you inherit the gene from the moment you're conceived, but the question is at what point does the disease process begin and at what point does that actually become expressed in terms of clinical signs and symptoms. So one of the great challenges in the clinic is knowing when someone comes to see you and they complain about this and that, whether it really is a reflection of the disease or whether it's just in fact uh, you know, the normal activities that we all suffer from a little bit in life. So one of the great challenges has been the capacity to be able to detect the very earliest changes indicative of the disease process beginning. So some people have done this with uh, memory tests. We've done some work ourselves looking at high level uh, thinking tasks. Other people have used imaging. Now the reason why all this is important is obviously it's important for the patient to let them know whether we think the disease process has begun. But obviously in terms of therapeutics, the best way to try and treat people uh, for this condition is to prevent them from getting it. But similarly, you don't want to start people on treatment years before they actually have any problems. So if we can accurately pick up that very point at which the disease process has begun, then that would be the optimal time to begin uh, any disease modifying therapy. Now by knowing that this disease is genetic and we know what the gene codes for, there's an obvious logical target which you can use, which is rather different, say, from a lot of uh, conditions like Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, frontotemporal dementia and such like. So in Huntington's disease, the abnormal gene obviously codes for an abnormal form of Huntington, this protein. So the logical place to target the disease would be to go for the abnormal gene or the gene product. And recently this has entered an exciting new area with the development of these so-called antisense oligonucleotides. So these are therapies which are designed to take out the, the uh, intermediate between the gene and the protein. Now these have been developed uh, by certain companies uh, and the strategy has been to try and actually use them, uh, at least in Huntington's disease, in people with early stage disease based on success that they've had in other disorders, most notably in the neurological world in uh, 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 young babies with an unusual form of motor neuron disease called spinal muscular atrophy. So the strategy here is to inject into the fluid around the spine and the brain uh, a so-called intrathecal injection, an antisense oligonucleotide against Huntington. Not against the mutant form, but against all forms of Huntington. By so doing, the idea would be that as it circulates around the fluid, it would actually uh, permeate into the brain. It would then silence the uh, RNA which is coding for the Huntington and reduce the levels of that protein. If it reduces the level of the protein, then the hope would be that the cell is more able to deal with the abnormal protein which is accumulating. The disease will therefore actually uh, slow down or even be reversed by this uh, approach. Now in 2017, uh, this was started uh, in about 46, 47 patients worldwide in a trial which was run by a company called Ionis. And what they did was that they injected over a four month period into the fluid at the back, an intrathecal injection as I say, either none of this agent, a placebo, a low dose, a medium dose and a high dose. Uh, and that uh, data is soon to be published in a paper uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine. And what that study showed was that actually if you injected this so-called antisense, then the higher the dose of the antisense, the lower the level of Huntington in the CSF. In other words, what it was designed to do was to reduce the levels and that was shown. 
The more critical question is obviously, did it actually make the patients better? And because it was a very short study and relatively small numbers of patients, we can't make any firm conclusions on that. But it appears that there is some relationship between the level of reduction in the protein and a clinical response in a favorable fashion. Namely, the greater the drop in the protein as a result of the antisense therapy in the highest dose, the, the slightly better the patient progressed, progression was over those few months. So this has been very encouraging because it's obviously got to the core of what the problem is. The question then is, does it actually really make a difference to how patients progress over time? So this has been tackled in a couple of ways. The first is all of those patients who are in the original study have now been entered into what they call an open label study. So this is a study where everybody now gets the active treatment. They've been a couple of different doses that have been used and they get this treatment either every month or every other month and people are followed over time. And obviously the hope there is by doing it over a year, a year and a half, you'll start to see not only that there's a reduction in the protein in the fluid around the brain and the uh, spine in the CSF, but actually the patients don't progress uh, as much as one would uh, expect. And that's obviously ongoing, so we don't know the results of that yet. This, however, has led to this whole approach it has uh, really caught people's imagination. And so Roche have now uh, invested in a big uh, adventure with this uh, therapy to actually try and do a definitive trial. So this trial is to take patients with Huntington's disease, several hundred of them, and randomize them to either having the treatment or not having the treatment and then following them over a longer period of time to see whether it really makes a difference to their clinical course. Now this is obviously very exciting times because if it was proven to actually slow down the disease, we would have for the very first time a disease modifying therapy and it's obviously targeting the most logical aspect of the disease. Now, there are issues around it. Obviously, there will always be a cost implication of what this actually involves because it's quite a complicated therapy, but there are also issues to do with delivery. So in order to get this agent into the areas of the brain that we need it to, we have to give it via a lumbar puncture, so a needle in the bottom of the spine. Obviously, if it works, that's terrific, but if you have to give those injections every two, three or four months, the question is whether that would be tolerated in the long term. So one could well imagine that people presenting, say, at the age of 25, would you really imagine that you'll be giving them lumbar punctures every few months for the next 60, 70 years of their life? So there will be issues about delivery. The other unknown about this is that when you put uh, this uh, drug into the fluid around the brain and the spine, the extent to which it can actually diffuse in and affect all the cells within the brain rather than those that are just on the surface. And that is currently unknown. But this is a very exciting time. So this idea that we can actually better diagnose when the disease process has started will obviously inform how ultimately we could use this treatment. This treatment at the moment, this antisense therapy, as I say, is being used in people with early stage disease. But if it worked, the logical place to use it would be in those patients who are so-called pre-manifest, don't actually have any features of it, but have on these subtle tests or imaging uh, changes which are indicative that the disease process has begun. The other major area, I would say, where people are thinking uh, about treating Huntington's disease is at the other end, if you like, of the problem. So the, the antisense therapy is designed to stop the production of the abnormal protein, which obviously leads to the disease. The alternative is to say, can't we increase its clearance? And so uh, we here have worked with David Rubenstein around a process called autophagy. So this is a uh, process within every cell which is designed to get rid of abnormal proteins. It's very much like the sort of rubbish truck turning up and emptying your bins. So the idea is that if we can actually increase that process, so rather than the rubbish truck coming uh, once every two weeks, once every week, then actually you could clear the protein out of the cell more efficiently and by so doing stop it accumulating and causing problems. So we did this a number of years ago with a drug which was actually uh, found in David's lab to do this in, in his preclinical animal models. This is a drug which was used for blood pressure uh, in the normal clinical practice, a drug called rimenidine, and we used that in uh, 16 patients to see whether it was tolerated and had any effect. Very difficult to know at this stage because the numbers were small. What we could say was that the drug was well tolerated and there was some uh, signal that it may have made some difference to the disease. So we're moving forward with a different drug now to see whether we can do uh, the same, namely take a group of patients, treat them with this drug, show that it's well tolerated and see whether we can actually make any difference to their disease course.
Now, ultimately, you could see how these two treatments could work together. You could take patients with uh, what you think is the onset of their disease or early stage disease, give them a treatment which reduces the production of the abnormal protein, so there's less of it being made in the cell, give them a drug which increases the clearance of it, getting rid of that protein, and the two together would be additive and work synergistically to actually reduce the protein that's causing the disease within the cell and thereby stop the uh, disease process. The advantage of drugs is obviously they can get into every cell in the body, so this has the capacity, unlike the intrathecal delivery, of perhaps having a greater effect in cells, which the intrathecal uh, ASA may have difficulty actually accessing. So at the moment I would say that the world of Hunt's disease is in an exciting place. This is a whole new conceptual approach to how we treat it. Whether these therapies will ultimately make a huge difference, we've yet to uh, find out. But even if they slowed down the disease by 50%, as opposed to completely cure people, that would have a major impact. Most people with Hunt's disease run a clinical course over 20 to 25 years, presenting in midlife. If it suddenly went from 20 to 25 years to 40 to 50 years, to all intents and purposes, we would have cured most people of this condition. So at the moment, I would say Hunting disease is in a new phase of its treatment. There's lots of excitement. We obviously have to be a little bit measured about it because the data on these trials at the moment is still very preliminary. But the hope is in the next few years, as these trials are rolled out, we'll get a clearer signal of whether we can really make a difference for the treatment of this condition.